We are on Nintendo Power number 60 for May of 1994, including the sixth year of Nintendo Power. In this issue, we are finally getting into Super Metroid, so I'm really looking forward to covering that. Let's get started. We're not underselling this issue, with Super Metroid on the cover. We have an action pose of Samus, but we sadly do not have a diorama cover. I, I miss those. In the letters column, we have general positive feedback for the magazine, though we get a response to the Famicom Rundown article from a few issues ago, asking for more info on upcoming in work titles, as opposed to ones that have been out for years. This makes sense, because around this time you have magazines like Electronic Gaming Monthly, and I believe Die Hard Game Fan had also started around this point, all of which had very extensive import coverage sections in the magazine. So, you're starting to get audiences who are now aware of games that are coming out in Japan, and that we're not getting some of them, and in turn also you're seeing ads for stores selling import games, if you didn't have just a straight-up game store in your area selling import games. Well, it's time for Super Metroid, and this issue it's also getting even more extensive coverage. Super Metroid has save points, it has auto maps, and this article has maps of Criteria, Brinstar, Norfair, and an ad for the upcoming Super Metroid Player's Guide. Super Metroid is a classic for a reason. It takes the very good controls from the original Metroid and puts a whole slew of quality of life improvements into the work. From being able to find maps of each of the reasons of Zibbies, to save points instead of using passwords, to taking advantage of the shoulder buttons to let you shoot at an angle, including while moving, as opposed to having to hold the directional pad in a diagonal direction. Super Metroid basically takes the concept of what we now call the Super Met the Metroidvania and really shows how it becomes a, a full-on genre, even more than it had been before with games like Blaster Master, because now you can spend more time with that game without it being an obnoxious hassle to keep track of pack passwords, without having to draw maps, that, that certainly can be entertaining and fun, and also, unlike with, say, Blaster Master, you can... you. Well, that game had no saves at all. As it is, this game is a ton of fun to play, and I made I made sure to hunt down a copy because this is a game I want to have in my collection. And I honestly really need to get around to playing more of this in the future, or maybe do just a full-on Let's Play for this channel. Next up is a fantasy brawler from Capcom, King of Dragons. Rather than getting level maps here, we get boss strategies for the first 16 bosses. King of Dragons is a game that feels like a really great, faithful arcade port of a brawler. But that's the problem. It's a faithful arcade port of a brawler with limited continues. I mean, it plays well, controls well, and aside from a few bits, there isn't much slowdown. It's just, it's a faithful port of a game that's designed to eat your money without adding quality of life improvements to reflect that you are playing at home. And including my cardinal sin for console games, especially arcade ports, limited continues. The game is fun and everything, but this feels like a game that should be played either in two-player or with a unlimited continues code. Next is the Super Nintendo version of Joe and Mac 2. I swear I've covered the NES or Game Boy version of this at some point before. Anyway, this article has some early level maps. The Super Nintendo version of this game is a generally solid platformer, though it's got a few issues. For example, in the first in the forced scrolling segment of the game, which is, involves a minecart sequence, you don't have any way to attack enemies that are in your cart's way, and wiping out the cart means instant death instead of causing you to lose the cart, which is an issue because this part of the game doesn't have any jumps you can't complete without the minecart. You could navigate this section just fine without it, it would just take longer. Having it operate something like, for example, losing the skateboard in Adventure Island would work a bunch better. and. Frankly, with like how they handled the minecart sequence in um, the Donkey Kong Country games, you jump on enemies with the minecart, you kill them, as opposed to taking damage, losing your minecart, and dying. So, this is just a badly put together chunk of game. We have another Hanna-Barbera game with Jetsons Invasion of the Planet Pirates, a platformer. This issue has a fold-out map of the game. The Jetsons Invasion of Planet Pirates has an interesting gameplay hook, a vacuum mechanic that is used to both take out enemies and for traversal of the game's environments, and with a little practice I was able to get the hang of the traversal part, 
and was really, really impressed with that aspect of the game. But the first boss fight of the game turns into a real balance problem. No pun intended. The enemy has a one-hit kill attack that, if you get close enough to him to grab you, will hit you. And due to how the level is designed, he's going to grab you. Now the attack just did a bunch of damage, giving you incentive to avoid it by also giving you a chance to recover and letting you learn the attack and how to avoid it, I wouldn't object. But you're having a one-hit KO boss for the first boss of the game. That's just that's just poor design there, man. And another sports game round up this issue with one basketball game, four baseball games, two soccer games, and one game each for um college football, racing, and pro wrestling. Barkley Shut Up and Jam is a pretty straightforward two-on-two basketball game. One which, well, began, since it didn't begin its life as an actual arcade game, it doesn't have the bad habits that NBA Jam had. Like, blatant, flagrant rubber banding. It's really fun to play, and I got a lot of enjoyment out of this game. However, I did, it didn't quite grab me in terms of well, it doesn't have the character of NBA Jam to a degree. I mean, yes, it's got Barkley, and it's got a, again, pretty straightforward arcade-style presentation, but, I mean, NBA Jam has its arcade over-the-top presentation elements, like, when you're on fire, you're actually, the ball is actually on fire, or smashing the rim, or that with the backboard, and that sort of thing. So, on the other hand, we, we don't have that. So... It's kind of a mixed bag. I'm from a just raw gameplay standpoint. I enjoy Barkley Shut Up and Jam more. From a presentational standpoint, NBA Jam is the much stronger game. Next is Bill Walsh College Football. I was not able to find a manual for this game, and so I had to try and fake my way through it. The good news was I was able to fake it moderately well. The bad news is. I was not able to fake it well enough. There are just basic interface controls, like scrolling between pages of the playbook, that I wasn't able to intuit in spite of a lot of fiddling. That in and of itself is frustrating, but then there's a slight icing on the top that, well, when you're dealing with a thing where I expect Oregon to be in it, like a sports game, a college sports game, or pro basketball game, or even a racing game like the crew, I expect Oregon to be there. And, well, this game has no Oregon universities. I'm, I'm not expecting the, the Portland Pilots or the University of Portland Vikings, First and I'm down. certainly not expecting the Oregon Tech Owls, but Beavers versus Ducks is one of the big rivalries of college football. And even if you don't have the license for the NCAA, having, like, at least one or two of the teams from Oregon is to be expected to have... I'm not, I'm not expecting, again, like, every Portland team, but at least either the Beavers or the Ducks, if not both. And so, considering that Super Play Action Football had both teams, the fact that neither one is present here is very disappointing and really puts a strike against the game in my point of view. If I'm going to play a sports game, ideally, I'm going to play my hometown team, and not having a team from my state is a, mark against, is a dramatic mark against it, and makes me less inclined to play it over a, a sports ball game that has my local team in it. So, there's that. MLB Players Association Baseball is a pretty good baseball sim. I appreciate it having the actual players, even if it doesn't have the teams. Again, as with Bill Walsh College Football, there is no control listing in the game itself and no facts for the game, but I was able to intuit the controls fairly well. The balance feels alright, with no real runaway losses or victories, at least with what I was able to play. Fielding was also generally good, with the place where the ball is set to land marked on the minimap, and the game auto selecting a player who is in a good position to get the ball if you remember to look at the map, which I kind of didn't in this footage. Still, this was a really fun baseball game to play, and I'm definitely liking this as a franchise, and while certainly the rosters and stuff are out of date, this is a game that feels more worth picking up than some other baseball titles. 
speaking of other baseball titles, we have Hardball 3, which is a little rough to get a handle on. Again, no in-game listing of controls, nor facts with the game controls. So consequently, I ended up in a weird situation in Season Mode where I was not able to select which team I was controlling, or rather, I was able to select the team I wanted to control. Instead of controlling Seattle, I ended up controlling Minnesota. That said, the game felt a lot more strategic than other baseball games. I had a few balls pitched at me that the game wouldn't let me swing at, and I could swing at pitches in the strike zone that would end up being popped flies or foul balls, but it seemed like the game recognized that baseball players would be better at spotting a pitch that was headed out of the strikes, headed for the strike zone better than the person playing the game was, and would adjust accordingly. Now, that said, I could be completely misinterpreting what was going on, though. I was I may have actually been in coaching mode as opposed to actual playing mode, or maybe this was CPU versus CPU, and I completely blame the lack of available documentation for that fact. Next is Super Bases Loaded 2, and it is, as with the other games in the series, a competent baseball game. This installment does stuff like using Mode 7 to handle fielding for grounders and low balls, and supports full season play with save functionality to have passwords. It's an improvement on Super Bases Loaded, considerably. However, pop flies are still something of an issue. The game doesn't provide the guidance that EA's title provides when it comes to anticipating where a pop fly can land, which, once again, leads to the computer having a dramatic fielding advantage compared to a human player. ESPN Baseball Tonight, on the other hand, is probably the worst baseball title covered this issue. As with Nolan Ryan Baseball, it locks the camera behind the catcher for the entire game, but it fails to have any strong assistive fielding, even with assisted fielding enabled to compensate. Now, in Nolan Ryan Baseball, way back on the NES, they made that camera angle work by having the game basically handle all the fielding itself, turning the game into a battle between the pitcher and the batter which made sense considering Ryan's reputation as a pitcher. Here, there isn't a similar structure or justification for the presentation. I will say in the game's favor, this is some tremendously well-done rotoscoping for the character animation, though it looks like the players all have the same uniform colors, which is kind of disappointing. No. Suzuka 8 Hours is a arcade motorcycle racing port, but one that has some slight control and interface issues. First. Unlike a lot of other racing games, there's no mini-map on the screen to provide you information on where you are on the track, the size of the corner ahead, and, well, where other racers are in relation to you. However, this is relatively minor when it comes to issues for cornering. Now, I understand motorcycles don't corners like cars, but still, the cornering is rather sluggish, particularly when it comes to starting and stopping your attempts to corner, which is naturally rather frustrating. This leads to a few situations on courses where I find myself fishtailing in order to get back in the correct line, or just wiping out entirely. Again, I realize motorcycles don't corner like cars, but also when I see people race motorcycles, when they come out of the corners, they're not fishtailing. Or even when I see people on motorcycles taking turns, they're not fishtailing. So, the, having to fishtail in order, once you come out of a corner to get everything lined up properly, feels like there's something off there, whether it's they need to use something assistive with how the cornering animation works or something else, I can't say. Natsume Championship Wrestling is a lot like the Fire Pro games in several respects. Like Fire Pro, the game's roster is made up of serial numbers filed off versions of real pro wrestlers like Stan Hansen and Kenta Kobashi. The roster also appears to be primarily taken from All Japan Pro Wrestling, with XBs of Giant Baba, Jumbo Saruta, Misahara Misawa, and Johnny Ace all also on the roster. And like Fire Pro Wrestling, success is highly based on timing. But I found that that timing is highly unforgiving. Even when playing on easy difficulty, I found myself not able to find the timing so I could get a hit in on my opponent with any degree of consistency. This is kind of a bummer, because this is an interestingly done game, and I appreciate having a competitor to the World Wrestling Federation when it comes to 16 bit wrestling games. If you can dedicate the time to figuring out the timing, I think you could certainly get something out of this, but if learning the timing is one of the reasons why you bounced off the Fire Pro games, this will also probably cause you problems. As with several of the other sports games I've covered this issue, 
there is no way in Champions World Class Soccer itself to view the game controls, nor facts that list the game controls outside of the game. This is a major issue because, well, while attempting to bow through playing the game, I wasn't able to perform basic and fundamental concepts to the game of soccer, like, well, passing the ball. I can kick the ball directly downfield, I can't pass laterally, nor kick the ball in an angle, nor even in the direction my player is facing. It doesn't help that the players move like players in a hockey game. You have an absurd amount of momentum, making turning to reach the ball more difficult than it should be. By comparison, Super Goal 2 plays considerably better, with passing, long kicks, and goal kicks being much more straightforward, though I was never quite able to get the hang of defensive moves. I was never really able to figure out what the different moves were and how effective they were in certain situations, though that's one of those things that with practice I'd probably figure out. Still, it plays and controls a lot better. Whoever you're passing to is highlighted on screen so you know who you're going to pass to and if they're open. And then there's again a designated pass button, along with different shot buttons for a particular type of just shots or going for a more long distance lob works a whole lot better, and much more intuitive and easy to learn. After the sports roundup, we have Spectre, a first-person battle tank game which feels like it has a cyberpunk theme. Spectre is a clone of Battlezone which has the look and feel of a port from an Amiga game, but the style of gameplay of an arcade game, in the sense that there are no continues in the game, so if you get a game over, you have to start over from the beginning. Now, this gameplay structure works perfectly in the arcade, or even for that matter with modern home console games with the advantage of online leaderboards, because you have the persistence of your last score and your competitor scores to keep going and motivate you to improve your performance rather than just bashing your head against the wall. Particularly if your game has no real narrative to speak of, and it's just more variations on different level layouts, that sort of thing. And it's more all about building up your high score. But, again, in the context of this console, the Super Nintendo, it doesn't hold up as well. We have our second Capcom fantasy-themed brawler of the issue with Knights of the Round. Knights of the Round is a generally solid brawler with few little issues. For a fighting game on brawler where the characters have swords, there is a distinct lack of reach for the character that makes managing enemies rather difficult. Now, this has a block button, which helps with some. However, the game appears to give some invincibility frames at, for a few successive blocks to hit by having a flash, the game's shorthand for iframes. But it's not clear if you're actually vulnerable or as a taken hits while still in flashing and gotten knocked back and taken damage. Additionally, you only have two lives to continue. By comparison, most other brawlers I've played normally give you three to four lives to continue, so this game you have to continue a lot. That said, I appear to have unlimited continues, at least on normal, so that makes continuing more of an annoyance than anything else. But now, the votes have been tabulated, and we have the results of the Nintendo Power Awards. Sweeping all of the awards from the Game Boy, we have Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, winning for graphics and sound, theme and fun, challenge, play control, and overall. On the NES, Mega Man 5 wins for graphics and sound, theme and fun, challenge, and play control. However, best overall on the NES goes to RC Pro-Am 2. Star Fox wins for best graphics and sound and challenge on the NES on Super Nintendo, while Secrets of Mana takes home theme and fun, Street Fighter 2 Turbo brings home best play control, and Mortal Kombat brings home two awards for best villain for Goro, but not Shang Tsung, and best overall. As far as for the remaining character awards, we have Kirby winning best hero, the Lost Vikings winning most innovative game, and Tecmo Super NBA bringing home best Super Nintendo sports game. Moving on to the classified information column, we get a stage select code for Wing Commander, the secret missions, and the tip for how you can get reused Fireball in Mega Man X. In the Super Metroid comic, we get Samus' backstory, and in Counselor's Corner, the extended guide to Crystallis continues.
We have another article covering the Super Game Boy with no really new material. I'm pretty sure most of this appeared previously. Our Game Boy coverage starts off week with a collection of Solitaire variants for the Game Boy, and I'm not going to review this because pretty much everything comes with Solitaire these days, so you don't need to hunt down a Solitaire game for the Game Boy unless you're a completionist. You've got Solitaire on your phone, you've got Solitaire on your desktop, you've got Solitaire probably on your consoles, you've got Solitaire everywhere, you have ways to play Solitaire, and every Solitaire variant even that one. However, the Game Boy title stood up, step up with Black Bass for the Game Boy. I've come to the conclusion I'm not the biggest fan of fishing games. Not because I don't like the fishing itself, but because dedicated fishing games tend to add elements to the game that make it actually a little more boring than anything else, like not having any way to know where the actual fish are. Well, yes, I get that this is the part of the thing with real world, real world fishing. I also live in Oregon. I can go real-world fishing if I want to. The idea behind video game fishing is to simplify the process. Our sole NES title this game is the NES version of Bonk's Adventure, with no level maps, just level notes. Bonk's Adventure is an extremely solid platformer, and I do like that Bonk's jump attack has an arc to it, one that you have to plan for when you're making your attacks. The jumping arc is pretty good, and isn't too floaty. Unlike the Game Boy version, also, the Bonk games work well on the TV screen because you have plenty of field of view so you can find out your movements and, again, address the arc of Bonk's jump attack. And so, the NES works great for this game. In the top 20, Super Metroid enters the running on the Super Nintendo side at number 3. Also, we finally get some info this time on how long the top three games on each platform have been on the list again, with some of the NES games, unsurprisingly, having been there since the beginning. Of note of the now playing is SOS, which is a cinematic platformer, kind of influenced by films like The Poseidon Adventure and Mega Man Soccer. In Pack Watch, we have more info on Project Reality, also known as the N64. Also, Capcom has another revision of Street Fighter 2 in the works with Super Street Fighter 2. Kimco has an RPG called Dragon View on the way, and there's info on Pocky and Rocky 2. Also, Electro Brain has some sort of dystopian cyberpunk game in the works called Future Zone. My pick of the issue is, if there was any question at all, Super Metroid. It is an all-time classic, not only of games for the Super Nintendo, but of Super but video games in general. It is a game that has frequently ended up on numerous publications and journalists' top, not just like top 100 lists, but like top 50 lists and top 25 lists. It might even top 10 lists. Next time, we start with the best of the rest of Nintendo Power's sixth year, and this time I'm pulling my picks from the Now Playing column. And because this is my first year pulling picks from the Now Playing column, we're having a massive stack of stuff here. Very big stack of stuff. So, as much as with the first... Um, Best of the rest that I did pulling from the top 20 column. So we're going to have to split this up into two chunks. And at least two chunks. And they're going to be long episodes. But they're going to be covering a lot of games over the course of these episodes. So you'll have that to look forward to. See you then. up with while recording my show. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and please click the notification button to be notified whenever new episodes of the show go live. If you really like the show, please consider backing my Patreon at patreon.com slash count0or. Backers can view episodes up to one week early. 
and also pick future games for Let's Plays. Thank you for watching.